Hello and welcome to session for August for Hospital 103 and related uh, individuals. Glad you could be with us uh, today uh, for this session. Uh, just as background, um, one of the things that I believe is that we can learn pathology uh, better if we have um, a structure uh, on which to uh, uh, build our knowledge. And a lot of times in training and in experience, <clears throat> cases are very random. And so they come to us uh, one day, one disease, and the next day, a brain tumor, the next day, a GI tumor. Um, and it's very um, haphazard. So what I have been doing is, is to try to collect um, sequences of uh, digital slides that can illustrate uh, both the variation within a particular disease entity category and the various other uh, disorders that can present uh, in that uh, organ. And so, um, I decided that uh, we would build the next one for salivary gland tumors. And so I'd like to share with you the beginning of this uh, process. So we won't get through all of these uh, cases tonight, uh, but you'll begin to see some of the spectrum of disease um, and the normal in uh, these uh, areas. And then we'll build on that uh, next time uh, with uh, more uh, cases. So uh, we're going to, to start with the uh, salivary glands. And I think it's important to just uh, see some of the normal findings that we see in salivary glands. Of course, these tend to be lobular uh, and have thin, delicate septi. Uh, we usually can identify uh, salivary ducts. And here you see some of these salivary ducts. Nice, usually a double layer of uh, cells, myoepithelial cells and uh, columnar cells. And then uh, we also have the uh, acinar parenchyma, uh, which can be both uh, somewhat mucinous and occasionally more acidic, acinic with uh, granular cells and so forth. Uh, we also know that the uh, parotid and the other salivary organs are slightly different. So this is a normal parotid. Uh, here's another example of normal parotid uh, where we see a little bit more fat uh, in the gland. Uh, as you can see here, uh, there's, this patient may be a little bit more obese or uh, just uh, at a different uh, stage in life. Uh, but you can again see that we have the very granular cells here uh, and the ductal cells here, as well as the uh, uh, glandular component here, the uh, seromucinous uh, cells as well. Uh, so uh, those are the components we expect with the normal parotid. And as you can see, there's some variation. Um, this I think also is a normal par parotid um, and it looks more like that first one. It may actually just be a second section from that uh, particular parotid. So I won't go into detail with that one. Um, here, I think we're looking at uh, normal submandibular gland. And I think as you recognize the, the proportions begin to change, we have uh, uh, somewhat fewer uh, seromucinous glands, or excuse me, fewer acinar glands, a few more seromucinous glands, as you see here. Um, and you still have the uh, uh, ductal uh, pattern uh, tissues, the more oncocytic cells. Um, but here you see a nice mixture of these uh, cell types. Um, this very pale example, uh, again, I think you can see uh, here we have shifted dramatically to have far more uh, seromucinous glands uh, 
so this is, uh, again, I believe um, the uh, submandibular gland uh, and more uh, ceramucinous glands and fewer of the acinar glands. Now, in normal glands, you can occasionally see a few clusters of lymphocytes, as you see here. Um, and we don't make a diagnosis of Sjogren's syndrome or autoimmune uh, paroditis or uh, sialadenitis, uh, unless we see uh, numbers of these uh, cellular aggregates that exceed um, the thresholds. And I uh, believe that threshold is, I think you have to have six aggregates or, or something of that sort. Uh, so here you're, you've got three or four in this area, maybe four over here. Uh, but uh, beyond that, uh, not, not too much. But it would be a consideration uh, if you started to see quite a bit of that uh, material uh, in the gland. Um, and here's, a, again, another normal salivary gland. Um, this is probably, um, again, I think this is a submandibular gland because you have more seromucinous glands and uh, acinar epithelium, again, showing the uh, variation that we can see. Um, sublingual gland. tends to be almost entirely uh, seromucinous. So I may have had some things mixed up here, but you get the impression uh, that I'm trying to aim for. And then lastly, I think we have to remember that uh, we have minor salivary glands, uh, which uh, occur beneath the uh, um, squamous mucosa of the mouth, sometimes at the base of the tongue, sometimes on the cheek. Um, and here again, you see a lobulated architecture and the same mixture of cells, the seromucinous gland, the acinar, uh, more granulated glands, and you'll have uh, ductal epithelium as well. Um, let's see where the ductal epithelium is here. Yeah, here we are. And again, this ductal epithelium uh, characteristically has um, two nuclei in several areas. So you have a bilayer of uh, epithelial lining, the myoepithelial cells and the uh, uh, duct lining cells with admixed fat and stroma. Now, I think we had a little bit, you could wonder uh, if in this little gland, you have an area where there's beginning atrophy as you see this little area here, uh, where we've lost some of the rich epithelial component. Um, and we still have a little bit of, uh, you know, seromucinous glands and the ducts remain, but we've lost uh, the majority of the seromucinous uh, glandular epithelium. So atrophy due to obstruction or inflammation or fibrosing processes will begin to appear uh, with this uh, type of a pattern where you have uh, some loss of the epithelium, and you begin to see stroma, uh, maybe a little inflammation between the lobular tissue. So um, one of the uh, more uh, dramatic uh, changes that we can see, uh, which is not necessarily neoplastic, is when we get a very dense sclerosing um, inflammatory process uh, in the gland. Uh, and this is oftentimes uh, believed to be cancer because these uh, glands are very hard. Um, the distinguishing characteristic, however, is that they're still somewhat mobile and they tend to have fairly sharp margins. But when we section them or they remove, they feel very, very concerning for malignancy because they're so hard. And you can see here why that is. There's just very abundant uh, fibrosis uh, at varying stages. Uh, you see some sort of mixed uh, fibroblastic reaction here. here you see very dense uh, hyaline collagenization uh, along with this process. 
Now, in many areas of the world, this type of sclerosing uh, sialadenitis is associated with um, the uh, IgG4 categories of diseases. Um, and so as we look, in fact, at this uh, lesion, uh, you can, I think, see here that we have quite a number of plasma cells. And so typically in our environment, uh, we will stain these to look for how many specific IgG4 uh, plasma cells we have relative to the total number of plasma cells. Um, and when that ratio is uh, uh, highly skewed toward the IgG4 uh, positive cells, we conclude that it uh, is one of these IgG4 related sclerosing diseases, which include um, autoimmune pancreatitis, which can include uh, varying forms of thyroiditis uh, and other uh, endocrine um, and mass forming lesions uh, that uh, can oftentimes be mistaken for neoplasia. So the salivary glands are one area where that uh, disorder uh, is uh, fairly frequently encountered. Um, and it has some other variations in terms of the makeup, or my point is not to go into that tonight, but to give you the uh, ability to see some of this spectrum of benign diseases uh, in the salivary glands that can uh, oftentimes be mistaken for cancer uh, clinically and sometimes even uh, pathologically if one is not aware of them. Here's a, another example. In this particular example, you see, um, again, a loss of, of the uh, um, tissue. You've got very dense fibrosis here. Um, and centrally, we have this uh, lymphoepithelial process with uh, germinal centers. Now, this is not quite the same process uh, that we uh, would have seen uh, with the uh, sclerosing um, IgG4 disease, which I believe is what I just showed you. Uh, but this could be another form of uh, autoimmune uh, sialadenitis, maybe um, Miculitz, maybe Sjogren's disease or something of that sort that could produce uh, this very prominent uh, uh, lymphoid and follicular response, as well as the fibrosing uh, response. Um, these are generally maybe better news for the patient than uh, neoplastic disease, although because of the potential for other organ involvement, uh, autoimmune diseases and so forth, they're not necessarily totally a benign diagnosis uh, for the patient. Okay, um, other benign disorders that we can encounter in the salivary glands include uh, mucosal, um, which is by definition a, uh, a significant ectasia of the duct. And I didn't pre-screen these slides really well, um, but I think you can see here that uh, the salivary tissue here is generally unaffected. But what is uh, uh, appearing to be uh, remarkable here is this um, dilated space with some reactive uh, inflammatory cells around it um, and probably some remnants of uh, epithelial lining here. Um, and clinically, this was you know, an, a dilated duct leading to the gland. This is maybe more common in minor salivary glands uh, or the sub-mandibular sub, uh, uh, gland, sublingual glands than it is in the parotid, um, unless we have, uh, well, and in, in several of those cases, uh, it's oftentimes stone related. Uh, so they may find a stone with obstruction and then um, uh, a degree of mucus production that uh, gives you a dilatation of the duct. All right, uh, another cystic uh, disorder that can occur in the salivary glands, uh, as well as in other locations, um, is a lymphoepithelial cyst. Um, so we see this in the pancreas, in the tail of the pancreas at times. Uh, 
uh, and we can also see it here in the pancreas, excuse me, in the uh, uh, parotid gland, where you see that we have a, an epithelium, a squamous epithelium lined cystic space, a degree of, uh, you know, squamous proliferation with a lot of keratin formation um, and surrounding uh, lymphoid tissue that's uh, fairly sharply demarcated. You see here, there's a very uh, smart, sharp boundary between these uh, lesions. Um, now, at times, these lesions can appear um, to be neoplastic, and, and uh, this is a, uh, a challenging differential at times um, and probably warrants uh, some careful workup um, to exclude uh, the possibility of, you know, say, P16-related uh, squamous carcinomas occurring in this location, um, because certainly, uh, you know, intra cystic squamous carcinomas can occur at a young age um, and you would want to uh, be able to differentiate that from uh, the pure lymphoepithelial cyst. Um, but on the other hand, you can see here, and this is a benign one, uh, you can see that there's quite a degree of squamous proliferation with cyst formation uh, throughout this uh, lesion. The things that help you in this case to believe that it's benign are the uh, maturation, which you see in almost all the areas towards a lumen. Uh, you don't see any uh, parakeratosis in the uh, luminal contents. They're all nice uh, squames, anucleate squames. Um, and um, the, uh, the other features you would see would, you know, would be based on immunohistochemistry, um, and a lack of any uh, significant uh, cytologic atypia. You know, there's a little bit of atypia here, a little bit of jumpling, but there's generally organization towards the basal layer um, and maturation to keratinization uh, in these other areas as well. Um, so uh, this is a, an interesting disorder, again, that can present as a cystic lesion. Um, they're not very common. Um, I think uh, in earlier times, uh, this was felt to be a uh, potential marker for um, uh, HIV-related disease, um, but I'm not sure that that has always uh, proven to be the case. It's certainly not true that everyone is related to HIV. Uh, notice here the other feature is that while it's uh, adjoining the, the uh, parotid, uh, it doesn't really truly uh, invade or involve the parotid anywhere. You know, it sort of abuts the parotid and sort of undulates around it, uh, but uh, uh, it's not actually uh, invading. Here's another feature I think that helps you as that you see other areas of this cyst have a very benign appearing squamous lining. So that's a, a very helpful feature as well. All right, um, so uh, here's another example of one of these. Um, and you can see there's uh, less uh, lymph lymphoid tissue. And here we are sort of uh, beginning to uh, abut the uh, parotid uh, with a little bit of involvement of this tissue, um, as you can see here. Uh, but the lymphoid tissue is, is more in the parotid than in the uh, uh, epithelial cyst, except over here where we've got more characteristic uh, finding. Now, um, this actually uh, points out that uh, in this case, because the epithelium is not squamous, it's more of a, uh, an oncocytic uh, glandular type of epithelium, this could fit into the category of a Warthin's uh, tumor. Uh, or so-called adenolymphoma um, with the associated lymphoid tissue and the oncocytic uh, lining epithelial cells. I don't believe we have other squamous elements here. So uh, lymphoepithelial cyst may be related to Warthin's tumor. As you can see here, the uh, uh, lymphoid component is uh, incomplete 
whereas in Warthin's tumor, it's usually entirely engulfing uh, the tumor or the, the process. Uh, here's another example. Uh, again, variable amounts of uh, lymphoid tissue. Um, and in this case, uh, benign epithelium, somewhat squamoid, um, but very thin. So three or four examples there of these uh, lymphoid and epithelial uh, lesions in the uh, uh, salivary glands, mostly parotid, uh, that you might encounter that uh, present as masses and uh, are excised. Um, usually imaging would show these to be fairly sharply circumscribed. And so if they did ultrasound or uh, uh, other studies preoperatively, they would usually know that this is uh, unlikely to be malignant. Well, the classic uh, Warthin's tumor is uh, characterized not just by this combination of lymphoid stroma and um, the oncocytic epithelium, uh, but also by a very uh, characteristic contents that uh, includes uh, blood, as you see here, uh, macrophages, and uh, old uh, uh, cellular debris um, that uh, some people have likened to uh, motor oil. Uh, and I know that uh, in uh, Southeast Asia, you do a lot of uh, needle aspirations of salivary gland lesions. And so you're probably very familiar, familiar with that uh, type of an appearance. Uh, this lesion has probably been traumatized. And so we don't have really good residual epithelium uh, in very many areas. And it might take a little bit of hunting. Uh, you also have more of this reactive uh, stroma around it. Uh, so it might uh, be a little bit difficult to identify the uh, lymphoid uh, component. Uh, but this is, again, illustrative of the spectrum of disease. So here, uh, whoops, here in this area, we begin to get a little bit more uh, of this combination of squamous and oncocytic type epithelium and a little bit more of the uh, lymphoid uh, type uh, tissue. So uh, it's, this is part of the value of uh, looking at a variety of different cases because you see that uh, not everything is classic uh, and uh, I wouldn't necessarily take pictures of this for uh, textbook illustrations because the lymphoid component is uh, rather bland. The epithelial component uh, looks a little bit squamous in areas. Um, but I think this can still be uh, safely put into the category of uh, Warthin's tumor. Um, and these are probably all uh, fairly similar related type of lesions. The difference is the degree of uh, um, trauma that they've suffered and so forth. Here's another uh, case from the files that was uh, termed Warthin's tumor. And you can see there's very little uh, lymphoid tissue. There's a lot of this scarring tissue around. Uh, and we do have a little bit of this uh, bland oncocytic uh, type of epithelium here. So again, a very lymphoid poor uh, Warthin's tumor uh, that came to excision, probably after uh, several times of being drained and so forth. Uh, we do see here, I believe, the very characteristic uh, cyst contents, a lot of uh, macrophages, blood debris, and pigment, uh, and so forth that we would associate with um, Warthin's tumor um, based on the appearance of the fluid. Uh, and for, for, for many people, the fluid is itself uh, virtually diagnostic, uh, even if you don't get uh, good tissue. Now, part of what's going on here is, as you can see, there's been some necrosis uh, of the lesion, maybe either due to hemorrhage into the, into the cyst that created an ischemic change uh, or other um, local factors that uh, cause that. So you can see necrosis in Warthin's tumor and it doesn't make it malignant. Now the caveat here, of course, is that we know that there are some Warthin-like 
uh, tumors, uh, particularly in the in the the uh, thyroid um, with papillary carcinoma that can be kind of Warthin's like. But I'm not aware of any in the uh, salivary glands that have that specific uh, masquerade. Now, of course, I want to show you at least one classic case. So this is uh, perhaps uh, more evidently classic. Here we have nicely developed uh, lymphoid component with germinal center formation and nicely developed epithelial component. But notice here that there's an additional change. In addition to kind of the oncocytic cells, we have uh, mucinous producing cells, mucin producing cells. Uh, and so we've seen squamous, we've seen oncocytic cells, and here you've seen mucinous epithelium that can occur uh, in an otherwise uh, uh, you know, benign uh, Warthin's tumor. And, and there's not a few of these uh, mucin cells here as well, as you can see. Uh, so uh, beware of the, the spectrum of changes in the wall, the spectrum of changes with regard to the amount of lymphoid tissue, and the spectrum of change that can be seen with regard to the epithelial component. Here's another example. Again, a nice uh, uh, seemingly classic uh, example, but in this case, everything is squamous. Um, so this has been in some categories or, or almost uh, you could say sebaceous like, because while you see very sharp cell borders, you've got some of this very foamy change uh, in the cells. Uh, and so some people use a different uh, term for this, uh, sort of a more sebaceous uh, cystadenoma uh, with uh, variable amounts of uh, lymphoid stroma. There is a little bit, as you can see here, a little bit and a few other areas. Uh, but I think uh, in terms of the pathogenesis of these processes, these are probably all very related and the distinction is just which of the epithelial cell components get turned on and to what degree they're turned on to proliferate uh, and what they uh, differentiate into as they do so. Uh, I think you'd see here again, you have kind of the characteristic Warthin-like uh, contents uh, of these lesions. And again, it's uh, somewhat separate from the remainder of the uh, parotid uh, in this case. So that's a nice kind of rundown of some of the more basic uh, um, benign lesions and normal morphology that we can expect with the uh, salivary glands. Um, another lesion that sometimes is mistaken for neoplasia when you see it, but more often is just kind of encountered when an, another more classic tumor is resected is a so-called nodular oncocytic uh, hyperplasia or metaplasia. And at low power, you can see what this is. It's kind of multiple areas, uh, somewhat nodular, and you've got all these pink cells. Well, as we come into higher magnification, we can see that these are, you know, very bland, packeted appearing cells with generally fairly uniform um, nuclear membranes, uh, uniform nuclei, and abundant eosinophilic uh, cytoplasm. And, you know, if this was a single mass lesion, you'd call it a, maybe an oncocytic adenoma. But when it's occurring in a multiple, uh, multinodular fashion, as you see here, sort of scattered throughout the gland, uh, it's not really a true uh, neoplasm in the sense that you would think of uh, neoplastic change. It's more of a, uh, you know, a field effect kind of metaplastic change uh, that can be uh, seen from time to time. Not very common, uh, but it is a, uh, uh, an entity to be aware of uh, as you uh, begin to look at more of these. Okay, so let's move on to the benign lesions and we'll hopefully have times to get through some of the uh, benign adenomatous lesions that we see uh, 
uh, in the parotid. And again, I've included, uh, as best I can, several examples of the, each of the varying types uh, that we can see uh, in the parotid. So we'll start off with the kind of monomorphous adenoma. Um, and this is characterized by uh, a single cell type, a single epithelial cell type, uh, usually uh, derived from the, the ductal cells. Um, so it has sort of a packeting uh, appearance. Uh, with or without a uh, little microlumina formation, um, more of an anastomosing pattern as you see here. Um, now, in some of these, they might have myoepithelial markers, uh, but because it's uh, you know kind of one single cell type throughout the lesion, uh, you can be comfortable in calling it a monomorphic adenoma, and uh, you really don't need to uh, categorize the cell type beyond that, um, provided you're looking at um, a truly uh, benign border. Now, if you begin to see uh, invasion into the surrounding you know, tissue, uh, then you might uh, begin to wonder about neoplastic transformation. But as you can see here, it's got a very nice, respectful uh, pattern with the adjacent tissue. And you can see here kind of what's happened to uh, some of the adjacent tissue. You've got a couple of cell types here, but essentially all of the acinar and seromucinous glands have been compressed. So you're left with the uh, ductal elements and myoepithelial elements here uh, in this uh, uh, marginal zone of the uh, lesion. I suppose alternately you could consider whether this is part of the tumor and you've got a uh, tumor here and more tumor here, and then this is your true capsule. Uh, so that also might be a possible interpretation here on this slide. Let's see if we've got other areas where we've got an interface. Well, I don't see. I guess down here, you've got a little bit of uh, normal uh, parotid tissue here to compare with. So probably what we were looking at up there before was uh, a compressed area of the tumor uh, in the, as the capsule was uh, somewhat divided. So let's look at another one just to see again more of the spectrum. Again, notice how kind of uniform color uh, this is and uh, quite cellular. Um, and as we come down again, you'll see uh, this pattern of kind of anastomosing uh, cords and bands of uh, cells uh, within here. Now here you get just a little bit of uh, a more ductal type differentiation with little lumina, as you see here. Uh, so there might be actually uh, some degree of, uh, you know, dual morphology, epithelial, myoepithelial cells here, uh, if you were to do uh, variable immunohistochemical staining with P63 or various cytokeratins, you might be able to demonstrate more than one population, uh, but it still fits into the category that we've used for a long time of uh, monomorphic adenoma. And with the sharp borders, it has a very good prognosis, um, as, you, as you know, if you've uh, resected the lesion. Of course, you want to look and make sure that it's not one of the neoplastic variants, uh, or the, uh, excuse me, the malignant variants uh, of some of the tumors that can here, appear here. Uh, but with the relatively bland cytology and the uniform pattern morphology, uh, you can fall comfortably on the benign side of things with this. Oh, here's a, here's a case that has a cystic type of change. Um, and uh, so it's a little bit unusual in that sense. Um, because you can see these uh, protein-filled cystic spaces here. Um, but as we look here at this tumor, again, it's fairly monotonous. This looks more like a slightly columnar cells rather than the uh, more spindle cells. So this is maybe more onto the uh, ductal epithelial than the myoepithelial type uh, cell type. Um, and uh, you can see that the uh, cells have a, a little bit of um, sort of palisading perpendicular to the, the cords. 
Now there's another entity that uh, enters into the differential diagnosis here, and that's the hyalinizing trabecular adenoma, which we'll have an example of uh, either later tonight or next time. Um, and uh, that also should be considered in the differential. And I'm gonna write, prepare a slide that will help to differentiate those, um, but I didn't do that for tonight. Uh, so we'll have to hold off on that. When we get to the hyalinizing trabecular adenoma, we'll, we'll bring that up uh, probably next time. Uh, but as you can see, sometimes these have a little bit of hemorrhage and hemosiderin deposition. Uh, they look a little bit papillary in that regard. But the boundary, the margins, nice hyalinized fibrous uh, boundary. Uh, and so it fits uh, comfortably into the monomorphic uh, uh, salivary gland adenoma um, and uh, should not pose any risk to the patient. Um, Okay, well, we couldn't talk about the salivary glands without talking about the uh, uh, more common lesion, the uh, pleomorphic adenoma. Uh, and as you all know, these are very common and, and they're also quite heterogeneous um, in terms of their behavior. And that's what pleomorphic means. It means a variety of morphologies. This lesion here has a nice admixture of the uh, epithelial, myoepithelial cells, um, and the very abundant uh, uh, mucopolysaccharide-rich ground substance that surrounds these uh, myoepithelial cells. Um, and we have a, a lesser number of uh, the ductile-type epithelial cells. Here's a, maybe a couple in there. Um, and they can be variably scattered within this lesion. Uh, but when we see the abundant ground substance, uh, then we use the term pleomorphic adenoma. Um, and uh, we don't make a big deal about differentiating which cells are myoepithelial and which are the ductal cells, but recognize that we will, if we do an FNA, we'll get a lot of the ground substance, we'll get some of these spindle and stellate safe cells, and we'll get some cohesive clusters of more epithelial type cells. Uh, I'm sure you've all seen these on uh, needle aspiration. They're very, very beautiful in terms of the abundant uh, metachromatic uh, uh, staining of the uh, ground substance with um, the GIMSA uh, type stains. Now, the thing about uh, pleomorphic adenoma uh, is that it does tend to have a scalloped margin, as you can see a little bit of that there, uh, and you can see a little bit here. Uh, there's a little bit of sort of a daughter uh, extension uh, in some areas. Uh, and this is what uh, brings the uh, risk of uh, recurrence if uh, only a marginal uh, excision is done rather than a uh, lobectomy or partial uh, parotidectomy. Um, but those little daughter areas can uh, grow back. Uh, typically, these lesions, uh, you know, can be stable in people for a long period of time. Now here we see more of the nice ductal pattern epithelial cells. Um, and so uh, sometimes people who are um, not, not worry warts, they don't uh, worry a great deal. They may just live with this bump in their parotid for a long time. Uh, and then later on, it will uh, begin to change uh, as uh, uh, the uh, second hits or third hits uh, produce a potential malignancy. Uh, and so then we have the uh, carcinoma ex pleomorphic adenoma. Uh, here again, just more of the uh, spectrum of disease or spectrum of changes that we can see in these. Uh, here you see a more cellular area uh, and you could wonder, is this uh, a transforming area of uh, neoplasia, except that it's, they're still very bland appearing uh, epithelial cells. Um, we have other areas where we have the myxoid uh, stroma. Uh, and here, as you see, a little bit of squamous differentiation. So that can also be seen in these lesions. And most characteristically, when carcinoma is developed from pleomorphic adenoma, it's out of these squamous elements. So the carcinomas that are most frequently seen are squamous carcinomas. 
but the fact that you see some squamous epithelium uh, in this lesion does not make it a uh, squamous uh, carcinoma. But this is probably one that's been around for quite a while because you can see it's uh, become very hyalinized. Um, and a lot of the uh, epithelial and myoepithelial components have been uh, left behind with just macrophages and a little bit of uh, ground substance here. Another example, this one very rich, uh, very pale staining uh, with the uh, ground substance, um, a little different H&E stain. Um, and then nice, nicely identifiable islands of uh, the epithelial element, uh, as you see here. So again, stellate uh, and spindle-shaped uh, stromal cells, myoepithelial cells, uh, and then epithelial islands and nests of varying uh, types, both uh, canalicular type or squamous type or otherwise. Now here's a lesion where, you know, it was uh, inked uh, along the uh, margin, as you can see here with a blue India ink. Um, and that is one way to communicate uh, to yourself either that this was a surgeon fracture uh, or not the true margin or something of that sort. Uh, so here we've got both black ink uh, and a blue ink that the pathologist has applied to differentiate or communicate something from the slide that is uh, distinctive and different uh, that needs to be accounted for when the uh, resection uh, is evaluated. Now, in general, if you're going to evaluate margins on these lesions, um, you generally would like a little bit more margin than this. This is a very minimal uh, margin and opens up the possibility for there to have been uh, an adjacent daughter area uh, that remains behind. Uh, and so I would call this a positive margin, uh, even though it's not fractured, uh, because it does have that risk of recurrence uh, that we've talked about. And, and here's just maybe one area that down here that might illustrate that. So if the surgeon had cut along here and along here, it would look like they had a margin, but they would have left behind this little fragment here. Now, of course, uh, because of the facial nerve, they oftentimes are very cautious about uh, how much they resect and uh, are, are aware if they're leaving behind tumor. Here's another uh, somewhat older, uh, more mature, long-standing uh, pleomorphic adenoma. Notice in this one, we have a little bit of fat. We also have a lot of the uh, hyaline collagenized stroma, <clears throat> but you can see we have uh, a mixture of epithelial cell types. Uh, this is almost more in the hamartomatous uh, category of tumor. Uh, we have some squamous elements and, and so forth, uh, but I think can still fit into that rubric of pleomorphic adenoma because we recognize there is a spectrum of disease that can be encountered with pleomorphic adenoma. Another example, again, a fairly uh, chondroid matrix rich one, relatively sparse epithelial elements, just a few areas. So you can understand why if you do a needle aspiration of one of these and your needle comes in here, you might get very few or even no epithelial elements that you can recognize if the needle course, say, went right along here and you missed this epithelial area or the one that was up here, you could have almost a pure myoepithelial and stromal uh, component uh, in your needle aspiration. But the stroma is very helpful and virtually diagnostic in and of itself. One more, <clears throat> this one from the skin. So uh, you're aware that uh, this term pleomorphic adenoma is used in a variety of locations. Um, and this tumor was from the skin. Uh, 
uh, to illustrate uh, that uh, this term um, has been liberally applied in other areas uh, when you see the combination of the mixoid uh, chondroid stroma, uh, bland epithelial elements of varying types, um, and uh, potential squamous or uh, canalicular ductal type epithelium uh, in the lesion. So the skin tumors are not the same tumor, they're not the same genetics, uh, but at present they're, they're ensconced in the literature and uh, you should be aware uh, that the term uh, will have a different uh, morphology uh, based on whether the lesion you're talking about is in the skin, the breast, or <clears throat> the salivary glands. There's another uh, lesion from the salivary glands. And again, notice this one's very rich in epithelium, almost monomorphic adenoma type of lesion. Um, and we may have had to hunt for some of the stromal elements. Uh, I think they're down here. Um, notice the growth pattern, however, here that we have these uh, adjacent daughter nests, if you will, of the tumor uh, that are uh, fairly close to um, the uh, major vascular structures. And this may actually be a lymphoid act. No, no, I think it's also salivary tumor. Um, so uh, <clears throat> those are the, the kinds of lesions. This actually may be a recurrent lesion, which is probably why they uh, included it here. Uh, and the recurrent lesions can change morphology uh, with, with loss of uh, the mixoid stroma and so forth, or more cellularity and, and so forth. Well, one more, uh, are you tired of these already? I'm getting tired of them here. Um, but again, just illustrating the different staining characteristics that we can see, uh, different levels of cellularity, uh, variability in margins. And again, here's this little daughter uh, nest over here, uh, right adjacent to something else. What's going on over here? Well, this also is part of the pleomorphic adenoma, but as you see, almost entirely uh, uh, canalicular and ductal type cells um, adjacent to this nodule of a very mixoid uh, stromal uh, type tissue. So a nice illustration of the variability even within one tumor uh, of the uh, varying cell types and cellularity that can be seen. Okay, well, another lesion that kind of is uh, similar, but a term that's uh, been adopted um, is uh, the basal cell adenoma. And while technically this might also be uh, termed um, a monomorph or a monomorphic adenoma. Uh, the cell type, as you can see here, is uh, a little bit different. Uh, and the pattern uh, tends to have this nice microglandular uh, appearance, microglandular or sieve-like pattern in the areas. Uh, and this is fairly characteristic of the basal cell adenoma. Now it's thought that these lesions have a somewhat different prognosis um, and therefore differentiating them is uh, worth the uh, time and effort. Notice at low magnification, this uh, sieve-like pattern almost looks like a starry sky pattern. And so you might even wonder at low magnification, is this a lymphoid lesion or something else? Uh, but it's created by these uh, little uh, sieve-like spaces that occasionally have more uh, eosinophilic cytoplasm in the cells surrounding them. Let's see if we've got another one of these. I believe we do. Here, a little different characteristic staining pattern, a more, uh, <clears throat> more eosin in this particular stain. Uh, but again, notice that you know, in some ways, this resembles the you know, monomorphic adenoma, 
but then we get this sieve like uh, pattern of uh, microcystic changes. So it's not quite the same as the prior case, but uh, the prominent uh, cystic changes, sieve like small cystic spaces, uh, would fit best with the basal cell adenoma. Uh, so maybe there's a little combination of myoepithelial and the basal cells in this uh, particular case. Here's another example, uh, maybe more akin to the first example, very um, hematoxylinophilic. Some cording and nesting of the cells. So somewhat similar again to that uh, monomorphic adenoma. Then you begin to get a little bit of this microcystic pattern here. Now the surgical management of these versus the uh, monomorphic adenomas is uh, not going to be terribly different. Uh, and so, uh, you know, your distinction of one versus the other uh, is not uh, mandatory. Um, in these cases. When I put together the tutorial, I'll put a few more bullet points into the uh, uh, presentation so that we can uh, hit those highlights a little bit better. Here's another example. And here you can see this pseudo starry sky pattern with the uh, microcystic spaces. And the eosinophilic uh, contents uh, to those areas. Notice in this case, we've got a fair degree of uh, central sclerosis um, that may indicate uh, you know, some scarring or react reaction to the, to the tumor. Uh, has been going on. And there may have been some uh, calcification or cystic formation there a little bit. Almost amyloid-like uh, protein here in some of these areas. Okay, well, we've about used an hour. I'm gonna stop with this case and we'll take uh, whatever questions you'd like to bring up at this point. I see there's some questions in the chat. Um, so let's uh, go there and uh, see what we've got. Yeah, so uh, Dr. Lin, you've asked the exact question and uh, uh, that is something I'm gonna put together a slide and I will send to you uh, with that. Um, <clears throat> Another question from Dr. Mary in Phnom Penh. So uh, cases uh, from resection specimens versus biopsies. Uh, so I would say that in most of our salivary tumors, uh, the biopsy is a cytology biopsy, a fine needle aspiration. Um, and, and that's because the distinction that needs to be made uh, prior to surgery is, uh, is this a benign adenoma? or is this a, uh, an invasive neoplasm? Is it something like adenoid cystic carcinoma or something like that, that is gonna be managed differently uh, operatively? Um, and so most of our samples that we get are fine needle aspiration samples. We do not routinely get uh, needle core biopsies or things of that uh, on these uh, les lesions. So a second question. Um, Oh, and, and I also say that, you know, in your cytology diagnoses, you know, you don't have to say monomorphic adenoma, you don't have to say 
um, you know, basal cell adenoma. You just have to say, you know, this is a, um, a low-grade neoplasm. This is not carcinoma. Um, it looks like a, you know, a, a mixed epithelial lesion or it's a pleomorphic pattern lesion. Uh, that's, that's enough for them to know how to manage the, the patient surgically. Um, so with regard to IgG4 related disease, um, this is a, I don't think there are, are firm um, universally applied standards for uh, interpreting the uh, IgG4 uh, stains. Uh, there are some generally res uh, suggested cutoffs uh, and, and clearly, if you've got a, you know, a predominance of IgG4 relative to IgG staining cells, uh, then it's going to make sense in the clinical scenario. Uh, some people recommend doing um, uh, measurement, uh, serologic measurement for IgG4. Uh, that has some help, um, but uh, in general, uh, if we see the characteristic morphology and we have enough IgG4 positive cells that we think they're a majority or a significant population, will suggest that it's IgG4 related disease. Very good questions. Thank you, Dr. Mary. Any other questions uh, tonight from anyone? Well, thanks everyone. Um, oh. Yeah, so ultrasound guided biopsies, and they, they can get then to the deeper lesions uh, in the parotid or salivary glands that you might not otherwise feel. Uh, so that, that, that's a very good technique for uh, lesions that are deep in the lobe and so forth. If it's palpable, you know, just palpation guided is fine. Uh, but uh, if it's discovered radiographically, then a CT or ultrasound guided uh, aspiration biopsy is generally fine. Uh, what they do want to consider sometimes with, especially with these adenomas or even with some of the tumors is that they're, they may have to excise the tract depending on the size of the needle. And so they want to approach them uh, in a, in a uh, understanding way so that they don't create a surgical problem by um, having uh, contaminated a, a large area a uh, potential field. All right, well, thank you everyone. It's been good to, to be with you and I will look forward to uh, uh, continuing this discussion. I'll send, send out some additional comments on the uh, um, uh, slide. Actually, what I'll probably do is post that in the uh, video link when I send that uh, for you. So thanks very much. Have a great day and I'll see you next time. You know, to hustle. Have a great day.